opportunity to introduce the Great. class today. Thanks. So last year, uh, we were hoping to have Professor Vale speak to us on this uh, his research with dog cancer. And alas, he can tell us what happened and why he had to uh, postpone. <laughs> and so I'm delighted that here we are on the 3rd of March, we get to hear about his research in the School of Veterinary Medicine on comparative cancer immunotherapies, novel immunotherapeutic strategies. Um, it's great to have you here, I really appreciate it. And if you'd like to tell us a little bit about yourself and then go ahead and start uh, in on your presentation, that would be great. Appreciate yeah, I really appreciate the opportunity to, to speak to you all today. Yeah, the reason um, that I uh, had to alter my schedule was um, that I contracted COVID back in late November, actually, the, whatever the week was that um, I was um, set to talk. I had a very mild case, you know, got over it fine. But uh, yeah, we had to uh, reschedule before that. So uh, myself, I'm a, a Western Canadian who um, received his veterinary degree up in Saskatoon, Saskatchewan. And um, then I um, uh, came down to Colorado State University at the Animal Cancer Center for my internship residency in veterinary medical oncology. And then I came to University of Wisconsin in 1990 uh, uh, to the veterinary school here uh, to join Dr. Greg McEwen, uh, who was really heading up the, the veterinary oncology program here and who had already started a really nice comparative oncology program here, one of the first in the nation. So. Uh, I've been here ever since, and um, uh, I'm also a member of the Carbone Cancer Center. We have a number of clinical trials running in tandem uh, with co-funding, uh, which I'll mention um, uh, somewhat today. So without further ado, I'm going to start by just kind of presenting the, hmm, maybe presenting this idea of comparative oncology or One Health. And, and um, you know, with the understanding that, that all species get cancer, uh, there are virtually no exceptions, uh, but our companion species, uh, pet dogs and pet cats, for example, have cancer levels uh, and incidents very similar to ours. And in many cases, they're similar. In some cases, they're different. Uh, and the idea of um, integrating the study of naturally occurring cancers in different animal species into the study of human cancer biology and therapy, we may be able to uh, accelerate the approach uh, and uh, get novel therapeutics into clinics for all species uh, quicker. And in the context of this talk, primarily referring to the inclusion of pet companion, pet dogs and cats as a complementary patient population or a surrogate population. Initially, it's designed to inform human clinical trials uh, in a preclinical setting, but then as these novel therapeutics move along the development pathway on the human side, then we can come back uh, into the veterinary side to answer specific questions that we may be able to answer um, uh, in, a, in a faster time frame. And importantly, because I'm a veterinarian at the end of the day, I want to ensure that this there's bi-directional flow of information, that is that anything novel, any new information, new therapies that are co-developed in this comparative approach that we get back in our veterinary population, our companion animal population as well. Um, kind of the classic uh, UW example of that is, is tomotherapy. Uh, Rock Mackey, who's a, a, a medical physicist uh, at the UW, um, initiated trials with Lisa Forrest and myself here uh, on his new technology of marrying a uh, CT scanner, um, an imaging device with a linear accelerator or radiation therapy device, such that you could image tumors as you treat them. It was the very first machine to use, use that technology. And the very first patients were our veterinary patients with nasal cancer. And that's actually morphed. Uh, we've got that, the second generation of that now, the Accuray or the Rad Exact uh, system. Uh, we're the only center in veterinary medicine that has that machine, and we're a beta center for development of that as well. 
Um, and so again, we've got the benefit now of, of that type of instrumentation uh, to treat our veterinary patients. So why are people interested in this comparative approach? Well, it's, it takes a long time and a great expense to move a new cancer drug into clinics. Uh, estimated that about eight years and one and a half billion dollars to move a new drug. And if you, if you look at uh, down here on the various phases of drug development, uh, we start off with literally hundreds of drugs and the pipeline shrinks over a long period of time with great expense down to just a few drugs that actually make it into clinics. And um, where we come into play is in a couple of places in the preclinical setting uh, where we can start to um, uh, give a, a yay, nay um, look at some of these drugs to see which ones uh, are better moved forward quicker. And then as I mentioned, then we work in parallel when these drugs are say, for example, in phase one in people looking at adverse events, we can be moving into in the, in the companion population to phase two, which is looking at efficacy or which, which tumor types might respond to this particular treatment. And so, for example, every night on the national news, you see Keytruda and many of the other immunotherapeutics uh, being advertised. Because of this eight years and one and a half billion dollars, of course, they're extremely expensive drugs, uh, about $13,000 a month last time I checked for, for Keytruda. So what we're trying to do is accelerate and improve this drug development process for both um, human medicine and certainly for veterinary medicine as well. Hmm. Some of the time my keyboard wants to respond and some of the time it doesn't. All right, so what are the potential opportunities for this comparative approach for including companion dogs, for example, as pictured here? Well, one, the, the, the life-threatening problem for cancer in our veterinary population is identical to that in people, and that's recurrence of cancer or spread or metastasis of cancer. Certainly there are other advantages. Uh, size and anatomy is very similar in our in our companion species, we don't have to uh, use different equipment for, for example, micro CT, micro PET for, for rodent models. The genetic targets are very, very similar for many tumor types. I'll show you an example with bone cancer in a minute. And very importantly, um, our, our, our companion population is very heterogeneous from a standpoint of genetics, as well as the standpoint of tumors, which we really don't get in rodent models. That is that if you, if you have 100 mice with the same tumor, it essentially equals one patient because there's no heterogeneity there. Um, these are all, as I mentioned, naturally occurring tumors. We're not creating these tumors in our, in our companion pet population, of course. And so that's much more recapitulates what goes on in, in human cancer. And because of that, um, they're naturally occurring in a, in, a, in a normal person or normal pet um, they have an intact immune system that can interact normally with an intact um, um, uh, environment. And that really is unlike most rodent models where, where it's very artificial. You either have a human tumor growing in an immunosuppressed uh, mouse microenvironment or the reverse, or you try and manipulate things. And so really companion species that develop naturally occurring tumors may at the end of the day recapitulate things better. Certainly there is a place for, for um, early preclinical modeling in, in rodents, for example, uh, but when we get into uh, issues that are determined by the heterogeneity of either the tumor or the individual and you require an intact immune system, uh, then uh, the inclusion of companion species may be advantageous. So the kind of the classic example that's always presented is osteosarcoma or bone cancer. It's a very common cancer in dogs. Uh, it is uh, an orphaned cancer in people. Uh, it's uh, very uncommon, about 800 uh, preteen and teens will develop osteosarcoma uh, annually in, in the United States, whereas uh, our canine population, about 18,000 canines will develop uh, spontaneous osteosarcoma. Uh, radiographically and pathologically, it's a very similar disease. Um, and unfortunately, the outcomes are also very similar. About 40% of pediatric patients will go on to develop widespread metastatic disease and about 90% of canine 
uh, patients will go on to develop widespread uh, uniformly fatal metastatic disease. And as I mentioned before, genetically, um, when um, canine osteosarcoma uh, uh, genome uh, uh, or gene expression was compared to uh, human uh, osteosarcoma gene expression patterns, they were almost indistinguishable. Um, and so from even a, a genetic standpoint, there's a lot of comparability. We also, um, from a standpoint of investigational clinical trials, we have a very enthusiastic client base. Um, we have some aggressive tumors that we do not have standard of care for in, in, our, in our veterinary population. Uh, all of these um, you know, more advanced cancer therapies are quite expensive and um, these investigational trials are funded such that uh, they cover the costs of treatment. And, and we provide some of the best veterinary care um, in the world, certainly. So the one thing that has really advanced this, this uh, idea of comparative oncology is that the infrastructure over the last 15 years has really, really increased. Uh, funding uh, has um, skyrocketed compared to where it was. It's still, um, we would say, substandard. But with the Cancer Moonshot Program, for example, a number of funding initiatives to uh, include companion species into uh, uh, drug or on, uh, cancer biology and cancer therapeutic research. Uh, the National Cancer Institute has a comparative oncology program. Uh, and part of that is the Comparative Oncology Trials Consortium of which we are a part of. Uh, we were one of the founding members of that. There's about 20 academic uh, centers across the United States and Canada that are involved in um, uh, a multi uh, center national trials of novel cancer therapeutics. Here at UW, we're one of six centers uh, in the Comparative Oncology Research Consortium, which is a consortium that was developed between those academic institutions that have both a human comprehensive cancer center and a veterinary school. And we're one of six of those. Uh, it is a, uh, a funding and research uh, consortium. The fiduciary body for that is the V Foundation. Some of you may be familiar with that. It's the largest um, um, uh, nonprofit uh, foundation for cancer research. They do all the, the grant management and fundraising for us. And then there are other groups that are involved in comparative oncology veterans affairs. I'll talk about a trial we have running uh, that's funded by the Veterans Administration. And we're part of the uh, Immuno-Oncology Translational Network. Um, um, again, comparing results um, trying to increase the, the uh, canine toolbox from a standpoint of research tools as well. From a standpoint of immunotherapy, which is really what we're gonna talk about. So comparative oncology, of course, involves many fields, but we're gonna, we're gonna um, focus down on immunotherapy. And I don't have to tell this group that uh, you know, in the last few years, immunotherapy is really thought of as the, has the most potential uh, to advance the treatment of cancer. Uh, in many cases, it was, um, you know, published in science in 2013 as the uh, breakthrough. And every year for the last five years at the American Society for uh, Clinical Oncology, some presentation was deemed, um, uh, uh, some immunotherapy presentation was deemed the advance of the year. So that's what we're gonna focus on here at the University of Wisconsin. I already mentioned uh, uh, Greg McEwen, my former mentor, he was the reason I came to UW. Uh, he started his career at the Animal Medical Center in New York City, and he uh, developed an association with uh, Memorial Sloan Kettering uh, to run clinical trials at the AMC and companion species. And then when he came here uh, in, I think, 1983 to UW, uh, he brought that program with him. Everybody can see what we've been missing for the last year on the right as well. So what is the overriding problem with cancer? Um, for the most part, uh, the majority of cancer patients, whether they be companion species or humans, throughout history, a diagnosis of metastatic disease has implied a, um, an incurable disease. And that for the most part still holds true today. Uh, yet in the era of immunotherapy for some diseases, some cancer types, uh, there is a small but measurable uh, minority of patients that can have 
spectacular durable responses and even cures with widespread metastatic disease. And, and most of you are familiar with the checkpoint inhibitors like Keytruda have revolutionized the therapy of uh, advanced stage lung cancer, advanced stage um, melanoma. Uh, but at the end of the day, there are only 20% of the population that respond to those drugs. And so the key is what's different about those 20% uh, that make them uh, responsive to, to this form of immunotherapy and, and how can we drag the other 80% into that group um, um, such that our response rates are higher. And, and that's where um, our work here at the uh, veterinary school and the Carbone looking at novel immunotherapies and combinations of immunotherapies, uh, we're trying to, to move this, this field forward. So um, one concept, the concept of immunosurveillance, if you're unfamiliar with it, uh, this is really what the immune system was designed uh, to do from a standpoint of, of early detection and killing of cancer before a patient actually develops a measurable tumor. And so the immune system will uh, identify uh, um, microscopic cancer cells as they're developing and uh, recognize them as being abnormal and clear them from the system. And that has a couple of major advantages, obviously. It can go anywhere in the, in the body for the most part. And uh, the immune system can create memory such that it can, it can recognize, should that happen again, uh, what's abnormal and clear it even faster. So um, unfortunately, the immune system, uh, just like every other part of our body as we age, uh, starts to deteriorate, this process of immunosenescence. And so uh, that's why, for the most part, most of the cancers that we deal with, um, with a few exceptions, occur in the aged population. So as we get older, of course, our T cell repertoires shrink the cancer killing cells and recognition cells, uh, their ability um, to recognize a wide variety of, of abnormalities starts to diminish over time. And, um, uh, in, and that's as our immune system kind of slows down and gets tired. And so a, a lot of um, what's being involved in, in immunotherapeutics is how do we reverse this immunosenescence and, and uh, revitalize and energize a tired, aged immune system. So because I was initially um, uh, asked to give this talk on, on our work with anti-cancer vaccines, I'm going to limit uh, this area of, of um, this approach of comparative immunotherapeutics to uh, our work with anti-cancer vaccines. And as you know, there are several types of, of anti-cancer vaccines out there. I'm going to spend some time on only those that we're actively involved with at this point. Uh, Peptide-based vaccines, uh, DNA vaccines, and um, our work with um, the Carbone in creating in situ vaccines. Ultimately, what we're trying to do, of course, is take uh, our immune system and our immune effector cells, of which there are several, as you know, uh, the cancer killer cells, and turn them on, make them recognize and get to cancer cells and hopefully clear the cancer. Now, most of these anti-cancer vaccines are being applied in the therapeutic um, sense, that is that once a patient has developed uh, a, a, an overt or a macroscopic cancer that's measurable and imageable, uh, and then we try these vaccine approaches. Ideally, we would like to have a prophylactic vaccine as, as for example, with the coronavirus. We want to give that vaccine before exposure and um, uh, to prevent, if the virus were to come along, uh, to prevent developing the disease in the first place. And I'm going to spend a little bit of time on our uh, vaccine against canine cancer study, which is actually a prophylactic cancer vaccine as well. All right. So what we're trying to do, of course, with vaccines is to um, uh, target particular tumor antigens. So uh, abnormal peptides or other small molecules that are present either on or within a cancer cell that the immune system we could, we could train to uh, recognize, react to, and then call in all the, the facets of the immune system uh, to clear that uh, and kill that, that particular cancer cell. 
So there are you know, a variety of different kinds of tumor antigens, uh, certainly beyond the scope of, of this short talk today. Um, but that's essentially what we're trying to do is create a vaccine situation uh, where we develop a, a targeted immune response, either an antibody or an effector cell response against that particular antigen in a meaningful way uh, and in such a way that, that we can kill that cancer cell. So um, kind of the, the most common type of, of uh, anti-cancer vaccine is a therapeutic vaccine uh, called a peptide vaccine. And very simplistically, a patient develops a particular tumor and you remove that, that, uh, uh, that tumor or a portion of that tumor, uh, send it off for analysis, for gene analysis and, and uh, significant bioinformatics work uh, to determine which peptides, uh, which potential antigens uh, are present in that tumor such that we can create a vaccine against that tumor. And so we can synthetically develop those peptides, grow them up, um, mix them with an adjuvant, something that will co-stimulate the immune system and then vaccinate the patient back and hopefully get a, um, a valid and clinically useful immune response against that particular uh, particular tumor. So that's probably the most common type. And again, that is a therapeutic vaccine. It's not a prophylactic vaccine. Now, one of the problems is that when we apply any of these immunotherapeutics uh, to a particular patient with macroscopic disease, um, what constitutes a clinical response to immunotherapy? How do we know whether our immunotherapy is working or not? And um, it would be ideal to have biomarkers early so that we could determine whether a patient should stay on an immunotherapeutic or not. They tend to be quite expensive at this particular time. Uh, and they're not devoid of, of side effects, certainly. So to be able to identify who's responding quickly and either continue on with the drug or move them on to something else would be ideal. Uh, problem is that with immunotherapeutics, our, our usual response criteria that we've been using for 100 years in, in, in um, uh, cancer medicine doesn't apply in many scenarios. So if you look on the, the graph that's up here on the upper left, um, uh, the um, y-axis is a change from baseline. So we're looking at size of the particular tumor. And on the y-axis is, uh, on the x-axis is some period of time kind of the standard cytotoxic chemotherapies, the chemotherapies that we've used for decades that we inject and they kill indiscriminately, rapidly dividing cells of which cancer cells are. Um, if we give a number of treatments, uh, the very typical response is if it works, you get a very quick kill of cancer cells. And so the volume of the cancer changes dramatically or the, the size of the cancer changes dramatically. With immunotherapy, there's a couple of different things that can go on. Uh, there's a subset of individuals that actually develop what's called pseudo progression. So after we start the immunotherapy, the measurable tumor actually gets bigger. And using our old response criteria, those patients would have would be deemed progressive disease and failing treatment, and they're kicked off a drug, which potentially could actually be helping. And so with pseudoprogression, we initially get a, an increase in the size of the nodule before it gets smaller. And that's illustrated on this um, histopathology on the right of, a, um, uh, I believe this was an osteosarcoma, it may be a melanoma as well, but that there's virtually no cancer cells left. All the increase in the tumor size um, is due to inflammation, which is what immunotherapy is trying to do, is bring in inflammatory effector cells. So that's why we can see an increase before we see a decrease. And so we have to alter our response criteria. The second thing that can occur is that um, uh, it's a much more delayed response. So the times that we take to actually assess response in the tumor um, uh, are much longer with immunotherapy. So we have to give our patients a longer period of time uh, before we deem them to have uh, before we've failed them uh, with therapy. So we've been working with um, um, ways of trying to enhance um, the, whoops, um, 
uh, our ability to uh, determine very early whether we're seeing an actual response or whether we're seeing pseudo progression. So most of you are familiar with CT, PET CT, uh, looking at tumors um, after treatment and determining whether the tumor is getting bigger or smaller. Again, that will not differentiate pseudo progression versus progression. So it, uh, we've been working with um, uh, Robert Urai uh, uh, over at Imaging, Medical Imaging, uh, trying to come up with a, a ratio of uh, something called um, radiomics, where you look at very subtle changes in imaging uh, to determine whether um, we can differentiate pseudo progression from actual progression. And what we've been looking at and applying now in, in our immunotherapy uh, patients is something called the um, image immune response ratio. And what we're looking at is um, the kind of the standard tracer for PET-CT, the radionuclide that's injected into individuals, and then we measure their tumors or their uptake of that particular tracer uh, is FDG, which is a radionuclide of glucose. So um, tumors use a lot of glucose, and so uh, they will light up with FDG. The problem is, um, that um, if we have a good inflammatory response, a good immune response, we'll also get a lot of inflammation. And inflammation uses a lot of glucose as well. So there'll be a lot of tracer from that. So FDG by itself will not differentiate between tumor proliferation and um, pseudo progression. But if we combine that in a ratio effect with FLT, which is a, a tracer a radionuclide of thymidine, and of course, anytime a cell proliferates, and, and replicates, it has to incorporate thymidine. Um, that is a measure of uh, proliferation. And looking at that ratio, um, can we discriminate between uh, a positive immune effect uh, and pseudoprogression and determine which patient should stay on therapy or move on to, to um, something else, certainly. So this is our first actual patient that we looked at that particular FDG FLT ratio. This is Fletcher. Fletcher had been actually in a number of our of our clinical trials. Um, he had osteosarcoma about uh, 18 months prior. He had had an amputation and then entered a comparative oncology trials consortium trial looking at a, a standard of care plus, uh, which is standard chemotherapy plus a novel. Um, mTOR inhibitor, a small molecule inhibitor of, a, of a, um, a bone pathway. And at about 18 months, he had a stump recurrence, which is an uncommon recurrence in the dog, but he did develop one. And so he was entered into this trial where we were going to try a novel immunotherapeutic and we were going to apply this, this um, um, FDG FLT ratio to see if we could determine whether uh, he was having a response or not. And one of the other advantages for a client to enter um, their companion in a clinical trial is, as I mentioned, they get ex their patient gets the um, their companion gets the most advanced care. And in this case, Fletcher on his initial uh, PET CT scan, we actually picked up an incidental thyroid carcinoma, uh, which was removed surgically, and then he continued on in, in trial. So that was certainly an advantage to them. Anyway, this is a Fletcher sagittal view of his initial uh, PET CT. And then what we do is um, over different treatment times, we, we perform FDG PET MR. Uh, so that's uh, a positron emission tomography uh, combined with uh, magnetic resonance imaging, of course, and FLT PET CT. And through different slices of his tumor, determine his FDG FLT ratio and then come back and look at that over time. And then in Fletcher's case, and as in many of our clinical trials patients, then we come back and surgically remove the tumor and we can globally look at the histology, the pathology and compare it um, to the FDG FLT ratios as well. So that's um, one of the problems that we're trying to solve. Um, and I've already talked about peptide vaccines. Um, and, and peptide vaccines that are used in a therapeutic sense. Now I'm gonna talk about peptide vaccines uh, as well as DNA vaccines uh, involved in a prophylactic setting. So if we, for example, could identify which peptide antigens um, most tumors are likely to express once they develop, then we could potentially create a prophylactic vaccine. That is that before the patient has 
uh, uh, the cancer, um, go ahead and vaccinate them just as we would for the coronavirus vaccine before they're exposed to it, uh, the virus. And once a tumor develops, the vaccine, uh, the, the uh, immune system of that particular patient would already be primed. It's kind of like putting up wanted posters throughout the body for, look, if you see this particular peptide antigen, go ahead and kill this cell. And uh, the technology was developed by Stefan Johnson. He's actually um, has two PhDs here from University of Wisconsin uh, several years ago. Uh, and he went on to, um, uh, he's now the director of, of medical uh, biotherapy at Arizona State University. And um, we formed, uh, we, we submitted this grant initially many years ago, five years ago to um, uh, the Department of Defense uh, in, in this, um, uh, I couldn't hear what you said. Uh, something came across, anyway. Um, uh, and had a high score, but an unfundable score. And that was opened up to other foundations and the Open Philanthropy Foundation funded this particular trial. There are three veterinary centers involved. There's ourselves, uh, Colorado State University and uh, University of California Davis. And this is the largest interventional trial in the history of veterinary medicine. 800 dogs uh, over five years at a cost of about $7 million. And what's involved is that a patient comes in um, we advertise for normal, healthy dogs, six years of age or older, and they come on in. We do a pre-screening looking for cancer, so medical imaging of the thorax, the abdomen, uh, physical exams. We go over the veterinary history of that particular patient, a lot of blood tests, and if we deem that patient to the best of our abilities to be cancer-free, then they're randomized to receive uh, this particular vaccine or the adjuvant alone, the, essentially the placebo arm. And then those dogs are followed for five years um, after vaccination. And we determine the, the endpoint is really incidence of cancer, uh, of any cancer over that five year period. And um, this was developed because um, um, uh, this particular vaccine has over 35 peptides in it or 35 uh, uh, DNA plasmids in it that code for that peptide. And as you'll see in a minute, they get both a DNA vaccine and a peptide vaccine. But this is a major paradigm shift in that trying to prevent cancer using a prophylactic vaccine. And also Stephen Johnson, he was, when he started to look at this, uh, most of the, the anti-cancer vaccines on the human side are based on DNA mutations, which can result in neoantigens and abnormal tumor associated antigens. Uh, but there's actually another method of developing abnormal peptides, and that's frame shift mutations that occur when, when um, DNA is replicated to RNA and then ultimately to peptides. So Stefan thought that we were kind of looking under the wrong lamppost. Uh, we should be looking under um, um, changes in, in um, these frame shifts. And looking at several hundred canine cancer patients and doing screens for these abnormal frame shifts. We came up with about 40 frame shifts that appear to be present in many different cancer histologies, so agnostic of, of histology. And then in rodent models, vaccinating against these frame shift peptides um, uh, was effective in preventing cancer. So it has moved into this human or this, this uh, veterinary trial where um, over the first two weeks, the patients are given two DNA-based uh, vaccines and then two peptide vaccines. And then over the course of the five-year study, there's annual boosters as well. And these are very biospecimen heavy trials as well. That is that at various time points, we're collecting uh, serum, plasma, uh, we're collecting um, uh, circulating DNA, we're collecting peripheral blood mononuclear cells so that we can look at different uh, lymphocyte subset populations, NK cells, things like that. So you know, that, that there's, uh, you know, this is a, a paradigm shift. Is this likely to work? I mean, it's, it's more likely to fail than to work. However, to have a, a prophylactic vaccine that's relatively inexpensive to produce, uh, that is agnostic of histology, uh, even if there's a 5% chance of, of this technology working, it would be, you know, a spectacular advance, especially for third world countries where um, these very expensive, specific patient-specific vaccines uh, really wouldn't uh, wouldn't fly. 
So we here at University of Wisconsin so far have, have entered about 270 of the dogs into this vaccine trial. And we enter about uh, uh, seven a week at this particular point. And we're at about the, we're approaching um, um, the two year mark for some of our patients. Um, and there'll be assessments uh, uh, serially throughout blinded assessments of the, of the populations. So uh, moving on, uh, that's kind of the, the um, um, a bit about a prophylactic vaccine. Uh, so we've talked about stimulating the immune system with vaccines. We've talked about the problem of how do we determine a response. Another huge problem in the, in the um, uh, oncology world, the immunotherapy world is we can turn the immune system on in such a way uh, to create a lot of these very specific anti-cancer circulating cells, T cells, NK cells, macrophages that are very specific and primed to kill cancer. But once they get into the cancer microenvironment and, and confront the cancer, um, the tumor may still escape the immune system. And this happens most of the time, actually. Uh, it can be due to general immune suppression in an aged patient or a cancer patient. Uh, but some of the tumors are poorly immunogenic and they may express checkpoints. Um, so you can get all the effector cells you want at the site of the tumor, uh, but the tumor starts to hold up or the microenvironment starts to hold up stop signs and says, look, don't kill me, I'm part of you, and it can shut down those cells. So a lot of the work that's being done uh, here and elsewhere is how do we get around that problem? So combining therapies like vaccines and checkpoint inhibitors, and as you'll see in a second, radiation therapy are really um, what we're looking at as far as to try and, and get around this tumor escape or tumor tolerance from the immune system. So a lot of our work has been exploring a combination of various immunotherapies and radiation therapy combinations. So in the era of immunotherapy, um, really uh, radiation has become a critical uh, component. And what we've been looking at with uh, Zach Morris's group over at the Carbone uh, is um, this idea of in situ vaccination. So another methodology. And what we're trying to do there is the other methodologies I've already talked about are we're creating a vaccine outside of the body, um, perhaps creating peptides, et cetera, and then injecting them into the body uh, such that um, uh, we would create a, a, a clinically relevant immune response. Within situ vaccinations, you're leaving the tumor in the patient and you're turning it into the vaccine for itself. And that has various advantages of which I really don't have time to get into, uh, but you can intuitively contemplate. Um, uh, and so um, the, the addition of radiation therapy alters the way the, the tumor is seen by the immune system. It also alters the players that are involved, uh, what uh, lymphocyte subsets, what cancer killer cells are involved and what antigens are being expressed. And it's been shown uh, historically that this may alter the way the immune system can clear a particular cancer. And so this is one of the ways that you can create an in situ cancer. You can deliver uh, a vaccine, you can deliver radiation therapy to the tumor and alter it in such a way um, that it's presented to the immune system in a more clinically relevant way that results in a relevant immune response. So this all kind of, kind of started with this idea of the abscopal effect. This is something that's been recognized for uh, about a hundred years um, and illustrated uh, by the cartoon of the dog on the left, it's been shown that some tumor types and in individuals that have a primary tumor that we're irradiating and that also have metastatic disease, that in the vast majority of patients, the vast majority, that we irradiate the primary site with external beam radiation therapy. And, and yes, the, the primary tumor gets smaller, but the metastatic disease continues to grow. However, a very small percentage of patients have an abscopal effect. That is that the primary site gets smaller, but also the metastatic disease gets smaller. So how do we change this minority of patients into the majority? So it's kind of illustrated with a lot of the work in the last couple of years that is showing that by giving immunotherapy, in particular the checkpoint immunotherapies, there are certain individuals that will respond. Remember I mentioned about 20% will have long-term 
durable responses. Uh, but there's now evidence to suggest that if we irradiate those tumors and then add in the, the checkpoint inhibition, um, that we can turn what would be a, deemed a cold tumor, that is one that wouldn't normally respond to the immunotherapeutic, into a hot tumor that would. And um, recent study that just came out, uh, this really illustrates the abscopal effect. These are patients that had uh, widespread non-smell cell uh, lung cancer, grade uh, stage four lung cancer, so multiple sites. And if they irradiated just one of those sites and added a checkpoint inhibitor, uh, the patients did significantly better. About 50% of those patients had durable responses compared to about 20% that did not get radiation therapy. So that's the impetus for a lot of this work. There are several mechanisms involved in how radiation may alter the immune system, um, altering the way antigens are presented, upregulating certain immunostimulating cytokines, and depleting certain lymphocyte subpopulations uh, that are suppressor populations. Um, these can take uh, various periods of time to occur. Ultimately, um, uh, this in and of itself, we are combining with, uh, again, other forms of immunotherapy. And um, so we're combining radiation therapy with another type of immunotherapy to create this in situ vaccine approach. And the approach that we've chosen is using an immunocytokine. And an immunocytokine is really a, a fusion of an antibody that will target the cancer. And in this case, a ganglioside called GD2, which certain cancer types in people and in dogs express. So that's the, the specificity of this particular immunotherapy. And that immunocytokine also is, is, um, has the monoclonal antibody linked to interleukin-2, which of course is a pluripotent immune stimulator. And you can give interleukin-2 by itself, but if you give it systemically, it has far too much toxicity. But if you specifically tag it to a monoclonal antibody and specify it for the tumor, uh, you can uh, really greatly uh, diminish any adverse events. So we're using that. We deliver that either intravenously or right into the tumor. And in the cases I'll show you, it's right into the tumor. And um, that will specifically target the tumor cell. And then the IL-2 will call in the immune effector cells to kill that, that particular cancer. So we're looking at a combination of radiation therapy and this immunocytokine. And looking at uh, Zach Morris's work at the Carbone in rodent models, he's shown that if you give a particular mouse a GD2 positive tumor and let it grow up, and then you irradiate it, and then you give the immunocytokine into the tumor as well, uh, that you get durable uh, responses with very high cure rates. So the purple line down at the bottom here is a mouse that received both radiation therapy and the immunocytokine. Um, the kind of the naive mouse is here where the tumor is growing, that's the y-axis. If you give the immunocytokine by itself or radiation therapy by itself, you get some response, but the tumor eventually grows. So you've just delayed the process. More importantly, that 70% that you cure of those mice, if we re-challenge them with the same tumor, those that were cured won't re-engraft, so um, they have memory. Their immune system recognizes that tumor and won't let the tumor grow up again. Whereas if you treat that mouse traditionally with surgery, um, they'll all regrow it. Uh, or if you deplete that mouse of the immune effector cells, the T cells in this case, um, they'll, they'll uh, redevelop the tumor. So that was the impetus for our Veterans Affairs uh, trial. And that's um, working with Mark Albertini, who heads up the melanoma group at the um, uh, Veterans Hospital here, and Paul Sondell, who is um, uh, intimately involved, he's a pediatric oncologist immunologist at the Carbone, uh, in the development of the immunocytokine. And you might wonder why the VA is funding this. Well, the, the um, um, military has a high incidence of malignant melanoma, primarily in those individuals that serve in the Middle East and high sunlight areas, which induces melanoma um, uh, 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 many forms of melanoma in people. So we were funded to look at this process in dogs, this, this um, uh, multimodality therapy in dogs with malignant melanoma. First thing, of course, we had to do was document that uh, dogs with melanoma express the target, the GD2, and the majority of them do, both in cell lines or in actual patients. 
And then we started our trial. And this was the very first patient to receive the immunocytokine therapy. This is Dino. Uh, Dino is a, obviously a Doberman. He's anesthetized, about to go into a PET CT scanner. Uh, he's in his alpha cradle here to hold him steady for every serial PET CT that we do. And if you look on his baseline PET CT, this is his tumor here. Uh, baseline, FDG is up at the top and FLT is at the bottom. One week after his immunotherapy was initiated, um, you can see that looking at FLT, which is the proliferation marker, his tumor has become absolutely quiet. So the proliferation um, has stopped and that's what we really like to see. Interestingly enough too, his, his uh, regional lymph node becomes really hot. So we've, this is kind of the stereotypical uh, response we would want to see for a positive immune response. That is the regional nodes are getting fired up and the tumor is, is um, uh, being inhibited. So this uh, grant involves um, dogs with melanoma that are treated with radiation therapy and um, the immunocytokine. Eventually we will be adding a checkpoint inhibitor as well into the final grouping, uh, but that's the impetus behind that particular trial. Now, what's the problem? The, the biggest problem uh, I've already mentioned is metastasis or spread of the tumor. And that leads to a new problem called concomitant immune tolerance. And what concomitant immune tolerance really is, it's a tumor specific effect where the, the metastatic tumor plays back on the primary tumor that you've applied your immunotherapy and your radiation therapy to and abrogates the immune response. So this is illustrated here, again, more of Zach Morris's mouse modeling where you give the, the tumor in one, one leg, and then you either give the same tumor in another leg or in a relevant tumor, a different tumor type, in this case, a pancreatic tumor in the other leg, then you irradiate one of them and you give your immunocytokine. So the same therapy, but now you've added a scenario where they have two tumors. Well, interestingly enough, if you look at the black line down at the bottom, and so we're looking at tumor volume again on the y-axis in a period of time on the x, um, if, if you still have just a single tumor and you do your therapy, you've already shown that we get durable responses. But if you have a second same tumor type in the opposite leg that isn't given the immunotherapy, it abrogates that effect. <clears throat> the same isn't true if the second tumor is a different tumor, like a pancreatic tumor it doesn't abrogate your immune therapy. It has to be the same tumor with the same antigens present. So um, through some novel work that Zach performed uh, over at the Carbone, he determined that you could actually give the second tumor very, even very, very low doses of radiation therapy and you would abrogate this concomitant immune tolerance. So if you look on the graphs in the bottom, um, you can, um, reprogram the system by giving just a, a very tiny dose of radiation to the metastatic disease, and you end up in both the primary tumor and the metastatic tumor, nice responses. So that's the, the impetus for um, uh, our, our second set of grants, a U01 grant and a PO1 grant from the National Cancer Institute, uh, of which we're looking at many things, but one component of that uh, is uh, pet dogs with, with malignant melanoma. But the big question comes, how do, we how do we deliver that low dose of radiation to all the metastatic disease in the body? Uh, it, it doesn't work if you just irradiate the whole body from a standpoint of side effects as well as we don't seem to get the same effect. So the way to get around that is something called molecularly targeted radionuclide therapy. And that's the impetus for the the um, U01 P01 study, working with a, a compound developed by Jamie, White, uh, Jamie Whitecart, a uh, chemist over at the Carbone. He's developed a compound NM600 that we can, um, um, that will collate just about any uh, heavy metal radionuclide that, that you can imagine. That can be given systemically. It is specifically, NM600 is specifically incorporated into the cell wall of cancer cells only, not normal cells. And so um, we could potentially give external beam higher dose radiation to the primary tumor and give them an IV injection of the uh, radionuclide based um, NM600, which would deliver the low dose of radiation to all the metastatic disease. And that's the impetus for this. 
uh, uh, Jamie's work um, earlier has shown that this NM600 is also agnostic of tumor type. That is, uh, just about any tumor type will uptake this compound. Uh, and if you look at on the very right panel, if you collate the radionuclide with the compound, it only goes to the tumor, um, although it's, it's cleared in the liver, but the liver is very tolerant of, of low doses of radiation therapy. If you just give the radionuclide by itself, it primarily um, uh, goes to the bone marrow, which is the organ of toxicity for radiation. And so we obviously don't want that. So um, first in mouse models, went ahead and gave um, uh, radiation therapy to the primary, gave the um, uh, immunocytokine to the primary, and then uh, gave the NM600 systemically. So the low dose chemotherapy systemically, and we got the same effect we saw uh, in the other most models, we can deliver to any um, metastatic site with that compound. So he's essentially getting near 100% clearance in the most model by using that combination. Uh, if you don't have access to checkpoint, if you just use radiation therapy and the targeted radiation, you get about 60% um, uh, cure rate. So then we moved into our dog population. And this is Rex, the very first dog to receive uh, this multimodality therapy. These are his PET CTs at serial times <clears throat> over the course of, of his initial assessment. And so what you find is that we use a PET CT scanner that, um, that the radionuclide uh, that's part of the um, compound uh, will be picked up in the PET CT scanner. When we give it, if you look at his two hour scans, you can see that it primarily is in the vascular compartment. So here's his heart at, at that thoracic level. Um, this is his brachial artery. Um, Rex had tumor in his lungs. He had tumor in his front limb and he had tumor in his hind limb. So at two hours post-injection in his PET CT, all the compound is in his bloodstream. But over time, over the next 24 hours, it leaves the bloodstream and starts to build up in all of his tumor sites. And this is what we use to determine the dose of, of the radionuclide that we're gonna actually use to treat his cancer so that we can get up to a, a, um, a two gray dose that will immunomodulate his tumors. This is another dog, this is um, Abby. Um, Abby also has a, malig uh, has a malignant melanoma with widespread lung metastasis. He also has metastasis in the um, uh, lumbar musculature and he had a jejunal metastasis as well. And so again, his baseline scan, most of the compound stays in his bloodstream, uh, but over time it starts to build up and deliver uh, that appropriate dose um, to his system. And then we compare that with the graph on the right that we can, as long as we have a two to one differential from bone marrow uh, to his tumors, and again, all the tumors pick it up, uh, we're delivering that immunomodulatory dose of radiation therapy to all the metastatic disease in the body. So this is the particular trial that we're involved in. We give the yttrium 86, which is what we use for the PET CT scan to determine the dose of yttrium 90. And then they get external beam radiation therapy to the primary tumor. They get yttrium 90 to all of their metastatic disease and they get the immunocytokine injected into their primary tumor. We've completed the first series of, of uh, dogs to determine that delivering two gray systemically uh, is safe. And we've um, collected all of our biospecimens to see how we've immune modulated those particular patients. So that's a lot of information to throw out at you in 55 minutes, of course, to give you a flavor of one, the idea of this comparative oncology approach, um, a little bit on immunotherapy, again, a huge topic. Uh, and how we're applying this comparative approach to immunotherapy uh, here at the University of Wisconsin. Um, this is, this actually, this um, uh, cartoon was created by the National Cancer Institute. This is one of our uh, comparative oncology trials consortium um, studies uh, for canine osteosarcoma. And uh, this paw print was created using the names of all of the, the companions that were involved in that particular trial. So we're very grateful to our our clients for allowing us to um, um, uh, enter these particular patients into our clinical trials. Um, lots of people involved, obviously, both here at the veterinary school uh, and at the Carbone. 
uh, and several funding institutions involved in this work as well. So that's my 55 minutes. I'll be happy to throw it open to questions and comments. I have a question. Sure. Um, when you use the NM600 to, to um, get to the other tumors, did you find tumors you didn't know existed? Yeah. Yeah, and so it's truly um, thought to be a theranostic. That is, it's a, it's a diagnostic and a thera, uh, therapeutic. So the yttrium 86 is the diagnostic, uh, both from a standpoint of looking for occult disease, but also from a standpoint of allowing the medical physicists to determine the dose of the therapeutic yttrium 90. Okay, and um, just another question. How big does the tumor have to be in order for that to find it? Yeah, well, that's a good question. Uh, that's dependent uh, on the tumor type. It's dependent on the equipment that you have, uh, the, how sensitive um, your PET CT scanner is. So it's all things that will actually improve as the technology improves as well. But it's certainly PET CT is kind of the gold standard or PET MR um, for finding occult disease right now in people. Thank you. And Professor Veal, thank you very much for doing this. I have to leave to go do a, another recording. I really appreciate this. Bia and Paul will help field the questions. Um, and Great, the opportunity, delighted that your COVID experience was mild. Uh, <laughs> thanks for hanging in there with us and coming back in March to give this talk. Yeah, thanks. Appreciate it. Thanks, right. doctor. Thank you. And, Go ahead, Paul, and be and keep filling the questions as long as people would like, and Professor Vale can do so. All right, thanks, Tom. Do you have a sense of how soon, or maybe it already is, any of these multi approaches to be in trials for humans? Yeah, so there is actually. Um, the, the initial, the, the, the Veterans Administration approach, which is the uh, immunocytokine <coughs> combined with radiation has been initiated in people. Um, the immunocytokine was developed uh, um, uh, through a lot of work with Paul Sondell is actually standard of care for children with nephroblastoma right now, uh, uh, not with, with radiation therapy, uh, but a, as a standalone because uh, nephroblastoma in kids expresses GD2 very strongly, and it is an efficacious therapy um, for that particular disease. So uh, some of the time uh, we presage what goes on in people, and other times we're asking questions in parallel. So if they find, for example, a novel adverse event that they didn't expect, or a novel um, event or biological event that... that um, we might be able to answer in a quicker time frame um, with a higher patient population. Uh, we'll investigate that as well. Thank you. For questions, everyone. I have a question too for you. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Okay. Uh, you had mentioned that both peptide vaccines and DNA vaccines are used or being investigated. Can you tell the Tell us the difference and why would both need be needed? Sure. So the, the peptide vaccines are, you do your analysis and you find out what peptide you want to you want to um, deliver as a vaccine. Um, but it's very expensive to grow up large quantities of the peptide to give. So a DNA vaccine, you actually just inject um, uh, many times intradermally or intramuscularly uh, the the DNA in a plasmid form with adjuvant um, and make the patient produce the peptide for you. And so it's much less expensive. There are other differences as well, but um, um, more subtle. Yeah, good question. Um, does anybody else have any other questions to ask while Professor Vale is here? 
or Dr. Vail, I guess. Are you teaching any classes currently, Professor? Um, yeah, we teach um, um, uh, both the third and fourth year veterinary students, as well as pharmacy students, nursing students, and some of the medical students uh, in um, comparative approaches, as well as I do some with um, family medicine, uh, some uh, clinical trial uh, lectures as well. Wow, that's a lot. That's a wide range of, uh, of students. <laughs> yeah. So a lay person question. Um, I understand where you get the sick dogs, but how do you get the healthy dogs to volunteer? Where do you get that from? Yeah, well, the cancer is an institute. Okay. Great question. Cancer is the number one killer of mature dogs. 60% um, of dogs will eventually die of cancer. Wow. Uh, it's just because they don't have arthrosclerotic cardiovascular disease. Okay. Um, so um, it's it's well known out there in the in the companion animal caregiver population, the breed groups, etc., that this is the biggest problem that they they uh, address. So when when this trial came out, I went on uh, Wisconsin Public Radio. We went on CNN. It was very well covered. We send uh, blast emails to all of our referring veterinarian population. We go to breeder clubs. We go to dog shows. And we say, we have this clinical trial available. And we literally, within two weeks, um, filled up our, uh, um, our allotment, which was about 260 vaccine cases for this university, it was whatever a third of 800 was. Um, and um, then COVID hit. So uh, that altered things quite a bit. Um, but um, we, we've, we've gone beyond our quota and we're outstripping the other centers. So uh, they're shifting uh, to us um, um, because we're, we're entering so many cases. So yeah, people are um, um, very interested in, in, in this particular trial. Um, uh, again, again, because it's such a, a major problem in the canine population. Thank you. I have been wondering how COVID has affected research. Could you be more specific um, about how it affected your research? Well, it affected it uh, in, in uh, several ways. Um, so uh, one, at the very beginning, we were the first place on campus to have an outbreak. <laughs> And they shut us down for a week. Well, it, this was very early when we really didn't know anything about COVID per se. And so they shut us down and came through with biohazard groups and you know steam cleaned the entire building. That was one thing. But the university more globally, uh, limited access to buildings. You could only have so many people per 100 square feet in your labs. Um, you had to justify people coming into your labs. And it was a multi-step process um, uh, through the, uh, you know, uh, sponsored programs and research um, where over the period of several months, the labs slowly started to reopen again. Um, then because most of our PET CT, PET MR work is being done over at the, at the Wimmer, uh, Wisconsin Institute for Medical Research over at the medical school complex, um, that added things to who's allowed to come in and who's not allowed to come in. And certainly we were, you know, low, low species on the totem pole for a while. Um, so it took time for the university to in stages, look at um, allowing uh, uh, researchers back into their labs, um, allowing uh, research assistants and ultimately students back into the labs. And so that really slowed the process. Uh, down quite a bit. And then, you know, you can imagine from a standpoint of, of people, people bringing sick pets into our hospital, they would have concerns, of course, of, you know, going out into the community with COVID, <clears throat> with healthy dogs, exposing themselves and moving about. Um, can you justify that? You know, so that was another kind of layer for us. Did it do more than delay any of your experiments? Did it um, ruin anything, make you start over with some things? It, it didn't with us. Um, you can intuitively think about 
you know, um, uh, experiments that were uh, involving laboratory animals that, um, um, you know, all of a sudden there couldn't be personnel to continue on with those experiments. And so they would be essentially stopped. Um, are, there, are there certain types of cancer that respond better to the immunotherapy? Than others? Yeah, so there are definitely more immunogenic tumors than others. Kind of the classic ones are malignant melanoma is a very immunogenic tumor, renal cell carcinoma, uh, and then subset, subsets of those. For example, lung cancer, uh, non-small cell lung cancer in people. Um, smokers are actually more responsive to immunotherapy than non-smokers. And the reason is that immunotherapy is targeting these novel antigens that are present. And many of those antigens are a result of, of mutations. Um, and smokers have a higher mutational load in their cancer because they're smokers. And so, um, yeah, if you were to get one of those checkpoint inhibitors like Keytruda for lung cancer, you're more likely to respond if you were a smoker than a non-smoker. So mutational load is really uh, important for a, a lot of the um, um, uh, immunotherapeutics. Um, uh, bladder cancer is another one that's highly immunogenic as well. So one of the things of course is to try and take colder tumors, poorly immunogenic tumors and make them hotter tumors. And that's a lot of the, the work either through radiation or immunocytokine work or what have you. Uh, thank you. All right. Well, I greatly appreciate the opportunity to come talk to you today. Um, if you have any other questions, you can certainly uh, email me or I'd be happy to attempt to answer them. So thank you very much, Dr. Vail. Pleasure. Thank you very much. B, you want to close it down? Sure, yeah, well, thanks again, Dr. Vail, and thanks everyone for the great questions and, and being here at Plato today. So we will see you all next week for Tom's mysterious talk on <laughs> what has happened during the pandemic. So I'm excited for that. All right. Thank you, everyone. Yes, Thank thanks you. again. Thank you for joining us. Thank you, B, for coordinating. Her. No problem. See you next week.